The second speaker from Oxford A. across the world for centuries is not one of the most gross and abject examples of oppression create, um, oppression uh, done by one side against another that we can ever possibly think of. In my speech, I'm going to talk about narratives and perceptions. I'm going to talk about how this isn't going to create resentment, how in fact it will energize the feminist movement. But before that, quite a lot of rebuttal. Firstly, he tells you if we give women reparations, they will be less likely to work hard. Two responses. One. If women want to work less hard after having been repaid for injustice, that is their prerogative. Two, our policy, Mr. Speaker, is to do it closing the pay gap, right? So if men are currently willing to work hard given the amount of money they're getting, and we close that gap, we don't see why women won't also be able to be willing to work hard uh, under that scenario. No analysis whatsoever, no thank you as to why that would be the case. The next thing he tells you is, well, we can't simply pay away all, all um, kinds of oppression. Well, fine. That isn't an argument against paying away those forms of oppression we can pay away, Mr. Speaker. Moreover, like we think often the state pays for things that aren't necessarily commensurable with money, with money. No, thank you. That's why people, for example, are compensated financially for health risks when they sue people um, for, for incurring them. The next thing he tells you is, well, we need to, we need to care not about the women of the past, but modern women. Firstly, those things aren't mutually exclusive. We can't view a debt of, of um, injustice towards women who, are, who had injustice perpetrated against them in the past and want to help modern women. Giving money to modern women helps modern women. No thank you. The next thing he tells you is, well, no, this is really confusing because women pay taxes and now taxes are going to women, so you have women paying women. Well, women and men pay taxes. This money only goes to women. Therefore, on average, uh, women... <laughs> Uh, no, thank you. Um, he the, next thing he, um, the next thing he tells you is this might create some sort of anger. Um, a few things to say here. Firstly, very often, so, like help, helping people who have had injustices perpetrated against them may create some sort of resentment. We see that affirmative action in the United States for the African American community has led to some resentment by racists and by people who are not necessarily racist. No, thank you. But it's also been, in many ways, very beneficial. What we tell you more is that one, we shouldn't be beholden, no thank you, to everyone who might feel slightly angry about a policy when it comes to, to um, solving one of the biggest injustices that have ever uh, been perpetrated. No, thank you. And secondly, like we're not saying we abolish the welfare system and then and, like, replace it with reparations for women. We all think all that like single fathers should also be, be helped because they're single fathers. That isn't inconsistent with saying that women have suffered injustices and women have structural disadvantages that must also be addressed. No, thank you. Um, okay, I'll, I'll take closing. Okay. Okay. Um, we think women probably should be paid equally. We support laws which require employers to pay, to, 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 pay um, like, to pay equally. However, it is very difficult to enforce every single way in, to, to mitigate every single way in which unequal pay brings about. It isn't like like companies publish pay scales where it's like if you're a man you get paid 50k, if you're a woman you get paid 40k. Rather, these things are done in subtle ways, which may not be locatable in the individual instances where they occur, but can be located as a broad phenomenon across society. Therefore, the only way in which we can solve it is by tapping the broad phenomenon across society. Um, that was quite good. Um, so, um, so, so, um, um, so, narratives and perceptions. Uh, narratives and perceptions. Um, because. It seems likely, um, and has been, uh, has been the case so far, that a lot of the opposition base to this is based around the idea that this creates negative perceptions of women in a couple of ways. How do we think this policy will actually play out if enacted? The first thing to say here is that we don't think that this will send the message that the problem has been de definitively solved. One reason for this, and one fairly obvious reason, is that we're not advocating a single payment, but rather a process of continued payment to women, recognizing that, the problem, that we expect the problem to persist over time. 
Secondly, because many, many of the problems associated with sexism or women being treated di differently and things like sexual relations will still be visible um, after our policy is, is, is um, enacted and can still be pointed out to people just as easy as they can be under the status quo. Thirdly, because, um, and, and thirdly, and perhaps most importantly, because a rec an admission that um, society is sexist and an apology um, for that by the state highlights exactly the sorts of problems that give rise to the need for reparations and exactly the kinds of um, injustices that have been committed, right? If people want to know why reparations are being given to women, they can, like, we can play them my speech and Ben's. People can see all they could want, like, why injustice is such a big problem. The second thing we want to say under this heading is that we think the message sent is, in fact, very positive. Um, and this is where we move from mitigation to benefits in this argument. What we tell you, the first thing that this policy does, is that it's a recognition that simple equality of opportunity, or formal equality of opportunity, in the forms of things like anti-discrimination laws and hiring, are not enough. That in, fa in fact, positive things need to be done to outweigh the harm that has already been done to women. This, in the past, has been an incredibly contentious issue politically in many states. We think it's time for the state, or rather all states, to take a strong stance on that and to say that, that uh, women need positive help for what's happened. This will energize the feminist discourse by showing, um, and I'll take, I'll take you in just a second, um, you know, that more needs to be done. Just go wherever he may be, that it was the state's fault and not his fault? No. Um, <laughs> the reason for this is twofold. One, because it's not, um, it's not mutually exclusive to say that it was partly the state's fault and partly the fault of sexists. Secondly, because the state is a locus for collective political action, it represents society more broadly, not a bunch of people like working in civil service jobs. And as such, given that these things are paid through taxes paid by society, it represents a broader admission of guilt by the people who pay taxes by society. So what's the last thing? Don't clap, I'm running out of time. What's the last thing um, I want to say here? Um, that is this. Our policy represents a recognition not that all of society is sexist. That some of the very basic ways in which our has been sexist in the past. Um, that some of the basic ways in which like, corporate power structures or the state have been set up have done so in a way that like, fundamentally disadvantaged women. And this helps to fight against resentment. And it does so because resentment often comes from the false belief in people that sexism is something that happens elsewhere. That it happens in other companies, but not mine. I treat people as they come. This tells you that we can never, that, like, at least for the time being, we have been unable to remove ourselves from the legacy of sexism, and that it's time to do a better job. Mr. Speaker, I am very, very proud to stand in proposition. Thank you very much.